Love you, Lord. We give you thanks, all glory, and honor, and honor, and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Take some time, greet each other, love each other. Good evening. Okay, I was just thinking about this. I'm looking around. I know some of the guys are going to be going up to the uh, the retreat this weekend. Um, I hope we actually gave out this information, but guys, if you haven't figured it out, it is November. And November in the local mountains means that it's a little cooler than it is down here. So it is going to be in the 30s overnight, kind of mid-30s. So... If you forgot what that's like, that's actually jacket weather, boys. So unless you're like from the, you know, the upper Midwest, then that's like a summer day. But for us, us weaklings, um, make sure you bring a jacket and you got to bring your own bedding and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, the, it's not the most comfortable bedding, I don't think. So bring a couple of sleeping bags and some blankets and stuff, you know. Pad yourself. You, you, yeah. Guys are supposed to be tough, right? We sleep on a beds and nails. I don't. Man, I, I'm all about being comfortable. So just a little FYI. And for all the guys who are not here tonight that didn't get that message, shame on them. They should have been here and they would have known this. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> we're going to finish out chapter 3 <coughs> of uh, 1 John tonight. And before we do that, I'd like to, I want to address something really quick because, you know, this is, uh, there, there's an election coming next Tuesday. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about it. You guys, if you've been around listening to, to this when, when it's been mentioned, um, you know I'm pretty cynical about the, the situation, especially because of California and all the rest of it. But 
I find it really an interesting thing. What, what is really going to, to probably have more to do with the direction of the church and the freedoms that we have as a church and, and the things that we'll be able to say over the pulpit, if we just look at how it is happening in other countries, the limitations that are happening on biblical speech and what, what churches are able to say over the pulpit is being governed by the, the courts in those countries. And because the courts will hand down um, decisions and uh, they're actually making it where even speech itself and what is being said over the pulpits can be so closely monitored that you can't even be biblically accurate without fear of being uh, brought up on charges and actually imprisoned. So going forward, um, if the Lord would leave us here long enough, what is going to happen as far as the church is concerned will be in the hands of the Supreme Court. So if you follow such things, the Supreme Court is lacking one justice, Antonin Scalia. And uh, who will be his replacement is a big deal. And then more than likely the next president, whoever that is, for the next uh, you know, one or two terms will more than likely put at least another two onto that court, maybe three. That means that you could have, if you have young enough justices being put on there and they live to their normal ages, that will set the course of the Supreme Court for the next generation. So if nothing else, because, you know, again, our, our vote in this state, as far as president is concerned, we can do it for matter of conscience, but as far as swaying it, for if you're going to vote on a conservative thinking, you know, uh, of, a, of Supreme Court and everything else, it doesn't really matter what you do, because the state does what it does. Just take a look at who who we have running for senator and you realize that it's like, well, do you prefer hemlock or cyanide? Uh, and that just tells you the state of things as far as the state is concerned. But that doesn't mean that we can't be praying. And so uh, for, uh, for the future, as far as the church is concerned, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens, let's say even a year from now, to see what's going on on the Supreme Court side of things. Because it is... Um, it is going to set the direction of this nation for a generation, whatever happens in the Supreme Court. Big, big deal. Right now, if they put a guy back in, or a woman just like Scalia, you have a, devoid, a divided court, four and four. Four conservative, four um, liberal, and then Kennedy, who's like right in the middle. And every once in a while, one of those others will cross over and do something unexpected. But you've got a four-four split and a guy who just pretty much goes in different directions at, at whatever the case may be. So very, very, very interesting where we go from here. So with that, um, that's coming up next Tuesday. And it is intriguing to watch all of the craziness going on, right? Uh, there's this great picture I saw of this little kid. And they, just, they wrote a caption to it. It's a little kid, and he's just screaming his head off. It looks like his mom's dragging him through the market. And he's just pitching a fit. We've all had kids do that, right? They just lose their minds. And so mom's just walking with him. And this kid is like, you know, lean back like this. Eyes are just full of tears. And he's just crying his eyes out, going crazy. And he says, I don't want to vote for either one of them. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you realize, man, when this is the best that we got, we are, we're not in the best of situations. But it's going to be one of those two, it would appear. With that said, uh, 1 John, and you know, after saying all of that, I am so comforted to be able to come to the Word of God and to watch all of the drama that's happening around the church and all that stuff. You know, um, those of you who know me best know I pay a lot of attention to this kind of stuff. And uh, this, whatever's happening outside of these doors that's so distressing when you read it, when we come here, all that stuff fades away. We just get to come together and go through the Word of God, and it's such, it is such a, a safe harbor in the midst of a troubled, tumultuous, stormy world. First uh, John chapter four, or chapter three, rather, we ended at verse three last week, so we're going to pick up there. We should be able to get through the end of the chapter. Some of it will sound like a bit of a repeat, but um, I think you'll find that as we kind of work through it, he's actually giving a bit more definition to some things that he has said, and you'll notice that um, these, these books, the more that we study the scripture, the more that you will notice that these guys were not, I don't believe, comparing notes. They had the same person speaking to them as they wrote. You can tell that the Spirit was working in these men. So we will look at the first of the books written as far as the epistles are concerned. We'll take a look at something that James had to say. 
And so James, the first of the epistles written very, very early in the church, is going to be uh, kind of trumpeted a little bit, John is going to say, which John is writing at the very end of the apostolic groups of guys, so 60 years, or probably more like about 50 years roughly later, John is saying basically the same thing. And so you can tell that these guys, first of all, they heard firsthand from the Lord himself, and he had instructed them, but the Holy Spirit is moving on these men. And they're saying the same things so that we would know that it's, it's a consistent message. So really, really interesting. Uh, verse 4 is where we begin tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us and for your, your goodness that you show towards us by giving us your Holy Spirit that we may know these things. We can come to your word and it is more than just literature. You have given us your word that we might know. And uh, John uses that, that term so often here, that we may know. So we would ask, Lord, that you would give us understanding ears as we come to your word and that we would take what we hear and that we would walk accordingly. So we thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. As John writes this, remember a little bit of kind of review of it. His, his um, writing to this group of people was because there were those that were trying to teach other things and this idea of deeper knowledge. And we get little glimpses of it because of how he's arguing his points. And so if you're going to be answering something that is kind of the prevailing thought in the world at the time, we may not know all the little nuances of it, but we can get a big picture idea by the arguments that are being made by the writer. And so as he, as he contrasts this, you'll notice that he keeps saying that we may know. You can know this. You can know that. And he uses that word over and over and over again. This was to counter those people who were saying, yeah, we've heard all of what's been taught before, but we have a different knowledge, an inside knowledge. And so John is able to say, well, time out. These guys weren't there. They don't have a deeper knowledge because there is no deeper knowledge than what Jesus taught. And here John is saying, I'm an eyewitness to him. So let me tell you what you can absolutely know, and it will be in agreement with the scripture. So from that point, we are able to piece together bits of this book and uh, understand why he's making the arguments. So great, that helps us with the historical aspect of it. But what's better for us to realize, too, is, okay, great, if it meant that to them, so then what does it mean to us? Are the same kind of people alive today? Are they teaching the exact same things or things that are kind of similar? And if they're teaching similar things, John gives us great indications of how to answer such questions. And so he's already done that. Remember just last week what we looked at. He had gone from that first chapter that was dealing with if we fall into sin. He is faithful and he is just to forgive us. And so those people that would say that they walk in the light but they're actually walking in darkness, they're a contradiction. But at the same time for those people that would say that they're without sin, well, no, of course they're not without sin. They've made God to be the liar because he has said that all men sin. So he, he went through all of that. Now he, in chapter 2, as we looked at last week, wants everybody to be in a place of expectation, realizing that there are false teachers that go out. Just as Peter was teaching, as we looked at in the last book that we studied, here we have it, John, by saying that there are those who teach falsely and we need to be aware of them. Here's what they teach. Here's how you can know the truth. And then he focuses us on the return of the Lord. And how that, that focusing on the return of the Lord, having that something in the front of your mind, is such an important way of purification of our own heart and mind. It keeps us focused. Now, you wouldn't say all of that unless you were concerned that a church could fall into apathy. Now, one of the best ways for a church to become apathetic is to quit paying attention to the world around it, to become so focused on what's going on in its own church that they don't see the big picture that there isn't a real concern about the imminent return of the Lord and that God predicts things in advance, the things that John was just talking about here, of knowing what's taking place in church and then being sure that the church itself is equipped, that the church would know, and that's why he keeps saying it over and over and over, that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. When we look at the seven churches in the book of Revelation, if you ask most people who are familiar with the book of Revelation, you ask them, if you look at the seven churches and you see the, the things said of the seven churches, almost to a person, you'll hear them say, ah, we're the church, you know, the, the world and the worldwide church is the church of Laodicea. Now, how many of you have heard that argument made? Okay. And it's always followed by, and that's the church that's in apostasy. But I would beg to differ. That is a church that is stuck in apathy. 
And it is stuck in a place of indifference because it's saying we trust in ourselves and all of what we have. The, or the, uh, the apostasy was taking place at Thyatira and Pergamos and places like that. Laodicea was just totally, as they saw themselves, self-sufficient. They figured that they had it all together. So they were stuck in a place of complacency and apathy. Complacency and apathy will keep you from paying attention to the world around you and makes you susceptible to deception. That's the problem. That's why Laodicea fell into the things that it had fallen into. And it is, I believe, exactly why John writes this. Don't listen to the people that are telling you something contrary. Stay with what the Word has to say. Be on guard. Don't be apathetic. Don't be indifferent to the Word of God. Be vigilant. So he gets us to this once again, and he starts to speak again in the terms like we saw a little bit more in chapter 1. Verse 4 tells us this. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now some of this, what you're going to notice, the way he frames this, is it's kind of like 1 plus 2 equals 3, or A plus B equals C. It's, just, it's almost written like Proverbs. They're just very easy to understand, and they're, they're contrasting kinds of things. So he closes the loop, applies a little bit of common sense, and just makes very simple to understand, straightforward statements. So this one right here, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. A lot of times you will see both of those words put together, and they're synonymous. In this case, he shows that there's a little bit of a distinction between them. Now, sinfulness just means, if we look at it in the most simple terms, just the dictionary term is to be a sinner or to sin is to miss the mark or to miss the ideals. God says, do this, and we attempt to do that, but we fail, we miss, we sin. But if a person commits sin habitually, and he'll mention it, it is a habitual or a practice, then they are also in a place of lawlessness, means that they aren't even being governed by God, therefore, their actions follow. So if you're not governed by God, sin is what follows, and that's what he ends up saying at the second part of the verse. Sin is lawlessness. You have no governing authority because you've rejected the authority of God, and therefore your actions prove that, sinfulness. And he says in verse 5, you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So he's going to, again, Come back to that place about saying, look, we know that God is who he is, and the ones who claim to be his are going to demonstrate it by fruit. It's just all that there is to it. And so the people that are demonstrating opposite fruit to that, well, we know who they belong to as well. And you've heard it said a number of times. Look, there is no, there's no Switzerland as far as heavenly uh, things are concerned. There's no neutrality here. You either belong to the Lord and you are bought and purchased by his blood and indwelt by his Holy Spirit, or you are not. Now, it doesn't mean that you're a horrible, you know, axe murderer if you're not a born-again person. It just simply means that you don't belong to the Lord who offers you eternal life by his sacrifice. That's really it. So, the fruit is going to be evident. Some fruit is much worse when people throw off more and more of the idea of God governing principles. We'll read about that in here just a little bit. So, in verse 5, we all know this. Jesus was manifested to take away our sins because he is sinless. Now, that first of all helps us to understand why he's qualified to pay the price that he did, but it also helps us to come to grips with the fact that he, was come, he has come here to put away the consequence of sin, even though all sin and fall short of his glory, right? We all know that from Romans. Well, there are those who may claim to know who he is, but have never sought him out for forgiveness. And so, as it goes on, it says, verse 6, Now, whoever abides in him does not sin. Again, this is habitual. It is, what do you do as far as practice? Remember, if you look at this, and again, this, is, this freaks people out when they read this, because if we just took it at face value, and this is the only place that sin was ever dealt with in the scripture, and we read it like this, whoever abides in him does not sin, wouldn't we all just leave here thinking we're doomed? We would, huh? Now, thank God he is so incredibly thorough to not only put that whole thing to rest just in John's epistle, but everywhere else where sin is dealt with. God will say, through whoever he's using to write the epistle, sin is an ever-present problem. But it doesn't have to have mastery over the believer. 
Now, he's going to use some of these practical kind of ways for us to understand it, but let me just make it really e easy for us here. From the time that we, got, that, that we were born again, now we may look at our lives right here, right now, in this place and say, I'm just not walking like I should. Let me ask you, are you a different person from the day that you first gave your life to him? Are you different? Are you still struggling with the ex exact same things and are you falling to them the same way that you used to with the frequency that you used to? Now, I'm hoping that you're all saying no. And if you do fall into those things, is there not just a terrible amount of remorse that never used to be present before? You're probably saying yes to all of these things and you should. And so that helps you to understand, though, yeah, I may not be perfect, but I also realize that God doesn't do that kind of a work in the unbeliever. He does that work in the believer who recognizes what sin is and looks to him for forgiveness and reconciliation and building up and edifying and all that stuff. That's when you know that God's actively at work in your life. And you don't want to resist it, but you certainly know because the Spirit is saying, no, 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 not acceptable. And in those times that you fall into it, he's the one that's calling you back to the Lord. Yeah, you're going to deal with your, your guilt and all the rest of it, but there is forgiveness. The Spirit's always going to be drawing you back. So, we can see it, he says in verse 6, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither him nor has known him. So this is again the habitual practice that is being spoken of. The English doesn't pick it up. But if you look at it in the original language, the Greek, the tenses of the verbs helps you to understand that he's talking about is this an ongoing kind of a situation and it is like the practice of life. It has happened in the past, it's happening currently, and it's going to continue to happen. For those people that are rejecting God, that is their life. They will always be in that place. So sin is all that they're known for because it's all that they ever practice. That is different for the believer because, yes, we may sin like everyone else. We fall short of his glory. He's perfect. So for those of us that are trying to qualify, well, I don't know if, if what I did is really sinful. If you even have to ask, it is. How about that? Now, the other part of it is that since God is perfect, anything that doesn't fit that or doesn't meet that standard, yeah, that's sinful. Now, it may be active, it may be passive, you may not even fully realize it until you read in the scripture sometime and you go, oh my gosh, I've been doing that all along, never thought of it as sinful, but there it is. All right, well, here he says, whoever abides in him does not practice habitually, doesn't now and won't continue to live in that kind of a condition. Now, verse 7 tells us this, after that nice, simple statement, little children, what a wonderful statement. He says it over and over and over again. Little children, let no one deceive you. Question, why do we have to worry about deception? Is it possible? Do you, do you tell people not to be deceived if deception isn't possible? Remember, we've gone over this, but I want to reemphasize it because so many people downplay this. The idea that the devil never takes a day off, you've heard me say it over and over and over again. Look, Jesus warned about deception and he said it would be one of the signs that would be increasing before his return. Uh, Matthew 24 is his first of his warnings. Do not be deceived. First of his warnings. And now here we have John saying the exact same thing and I just have to ask, if it was so back then, should it not even more so be the case now? Because we're closer to the Lord's return than these guys were. And I don't think they could have even thought that we would be here 2,000 years later, but here we are. So, vigilance, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices, see now he's used the word, practices. He uses it in the positive sense because it says, now again he's talking about little children, as opposed to those other ones who abide in, in you know, that idea of abiding um, in, in him doesn't sin, but the person that doesn't abide, you know, we get all that. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he, Jesus, is righteous. Now that sounds cute and it's a play on words, but here's the easiest way for us to understand it. We know that God in, in the person of Christ Jesus is absolutely acceptable to the Father. We're studying that on Sunday mornings, right? He's the one who said, I always do those things that please my Father. Okay, so we know that as far as Jesus is concerned, he is totally acceptable to his Father. If we call ourselves Christians, meaning Christ-like, and we have a relationship with him by his Holy Spirit, would we not demonstrate the same exact traits? 
at, at least to some extent. We're not going to be exactly like he is, but we are certainly going to be different from the rest of the world, certainly different than we were before we met him, which would end up making us then righteous as far as God is concerned, acceptable to him. Why? Because his son is acceptable to him, and we are becoming more like he is day by day. Simple. Now, in verse 8 it tells us, that uh, by this contrast, look at verse 8, it's a total contrast. He who sins is of the devil. Now, we were told that we're of God because we demonstrate righteousness and Jesus himself is righteous. So here's your contrast. But he who sins habitually practices, remember he mentions the word practices in, the, in verse 7. Well, how about the people that practice the same kind of thing in verse 8? Well, he who sins as a practice or habitually is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested. Why is that? That he might destroy the works of the devil. You know, there are times when you will read passages in, in the Bible and they'll just kind of make, make your, if you will, your heart kind of swell. Or you'll just, you'll gravitate towards verses because of the import of what they're saying. This is one such verse. And it's easy to read over, but look at especially the second part of it. This is the reason, this is the purpose, that the Son of God was manifested. Here is why he came to earth, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Do we really grasp that? That what he did by, what he, you know, by, by going through that whole week and by dying and resurrecting and ascending, all of those things, it was all for one purpose, and that was to put away the consequence of sin over the life of the human being. And to those who would come to him by faith, it would have an eternal consequence and it redeems that person back eternally. We'll spend our eternity with him because of that. That is his whole reason for being here. Now, again, think about it. Jesus did not come here so people could have bookstores. It wasn't so that they could do all of those kind of things that we've made him into such a marketing kind of a thing. He came here to deal with the matter of sin. Plain and simple. It is as, as obvious as it could be. That he might destroy the works of the devil. The devil owned us. Caused us to fall into that place of sin and there was no way to reconcile that. He came to put, a, put that away. Amazing. Verse 9. Whoever has been born of God, call that born again, renewed, regenerated, whatever word you want to use, we know what it means. Chapter 3, when Jesus talked about being born again, this is what he's referring to. So whoever has been born of God does not sin. Again, this is a matter of habitual things. Why? Well, because his, that means God's seed, remains in him. That work that God began continues on in the life of that believer. That, that work that God had done continues. Here's how you know. And so he says the seed remains in him and he cannot sin. Why? Because he's been born of God. So a person that is genuinely born again will never fall into a habitual practice and not have the awareness that what they're doing is so repulsive to God that they don't repent. Now, you can get into the whole argument about, well, what about once saved, always saved, and all the rest of it? Isn't it funny? John doesn't seem all that concerned about that debate. He just makes a straightforward statement. He just says, whoever has been born of God does not sin. That's all you need to know. Now, let people go ahead and get into the whole debate about losing your salvation and all the rest of it. This is one thing that I know. I remember asking Jack years ago. It was the greatest answer I ever heard, and it was so simple. It, it, it sound, it, a five-year-old could understand it. And I had asked him about, you know, once saved, always saved, and we always use the hypothetical person. Well, what about the person that does this, and what about the person that does that? And we lay out this whole big, long scenario, and we're still all at the same place of just having to figure out, you know, how do you even answer the question? Jack said, hey, look, all I know is this. Only Christians go to heaven. <laughs> I really have a hard time arguing with that. So it was really great. There were more times that I asked him those kind of questions and I just walked away kind of shaking my head, mumbling to myself because it's like, well, gosh, you know, that's really simple. So <laughs> it's, it's so funny. We get into all these debates over the hypotheticals. But here's what we know. Christians go to heaven. Now, if a person has a question of whether or not, a, whether or not I'm a believer, trust me, folks, we have volumes of books written in the New Testament that will settle that issue for you. Whether you choose to believe them is completely on you. Because John's going to continue on this. He has some really, really practical advice for people who struggle with such things. Now, 
In verse 10 it says now this, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest by their actions, the things that they produce. And so he says, the children of the devil are manifest, that the children of God, children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So he throws in another test. You're going to know whether or not there is love because of how you treat your brothers, and it's going to be a direct evidence. He's going to come back to this more than once before we finish this chapter. It is a recurring theme, and you know for a fact that he was listening to what the Lord had to say. Because Jesus taught on this a lot. And here he is, 60 years later, writing about it and, and repeating the same things that he heard from his master, from his Lord. So he says this. This is how you can tell. Children of the devil, the children of God. Whoever is not of God is, uh, does, uh, does not practice righteousness and does not love his brother. Four, verse 11. This is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, I could, I could go to that reference right now, or we could do it at the end of this chapter, because he says it again. Let's just go ahead and look at this first of these references. John chapter 13. Now, if I was to say John chapter 14... Those of you who have read through the gospel enough, you already know John 14 is a very famous verse. It's where Jesus says that he goes to prepare a place for us and all the rest of that, right? We know that that is where he says that he's the way, the truth, and the life because you can't follow me and all the rest of that. And sometimes when we read those passages, it is also really instructive for us to read the verses right before it. So what does Jesus say that leads him to say? Look at, since we're there, look at chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. What's the implication of that? Their hearts are troubled. Well, are they troubled because of all of what he's been saying to them? Let's remember, he's now beginning the last discourses. He's in the last hours of his life, and he's now preparing them for his departure. So, a little bit earlier in chapter 13, right before he says what we just read there, let not your heart be troubled, look at what he says in verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, and who was it he that went out? Judas. And because Jesus told him, look, what you're going to do, go do quickly. Jesus knew it was he who was betraying. He's already, he's already called him out on it. Now he says, go do what you're going to do. When Judas leaves, now he's just left with the rest of the disciples who are faithful to him. So he says, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify himself and glory him immediately. Glorify himself immediately. Here's the, it's just a lot of himself and he and all that. The point is, the time is now. And God is going to glorify the Son by having him put to death but raising him from the dead. And it will bring glory to the Father and to the Son. He's telling them that this is taking place. Look at verse 33. Interesting verse. Little children. It's not the first time that John used it. He was used to hearing it from the Lord. Carrying on the tradition. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer, and you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you would love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So this is one of the places that you see it most clearly said. Jesus does mention this in other places as well. And he's going to do it in this dialogue in the last hours of his life. You know that he says it in chapter 15 the same way. But his point is of all of the things that anybody would be able to point to as an evidence of the work of God in the believer, there is no greater evidence than that you would see it demonstrated by how the church interacts with itself. How does the body minister to itself? Is it loving or is it filled with anger and resentment and hatred and backbiting and gossiping and all the rest? That happens in every church I've ever seen. The question is, how much does it happen and does it get brought to account? And then is it done away with? That's when you know a healthy church is, is doing well, that there is love one for another and whenever something breaks that unity, it's, it's addressed and it's fixed. So here he says, they will know that you're my disciples. Now, interesting uh, 
We'll get to this on Sunday mornings, but I just have to throw this in because it's kind of funny. And then so, of course, who steps up? Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, so where are you going? Well, this is what the Jews were asking. And so he says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. So this is the dialogue that leads us to chapter 14 when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. So this is the running part of that. And of course, let's do this. Verse 37, so Peter said to him, Lord, well, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. This is one of those things that Peter wishes that he had to say over again, right? Now, it's cool. When we're in Israel, we go to the place where this happened. We go to Caiaphas' house where Jesus actually, or where, uh, well, Jesus was being interrogated and Peter was watching from afar and he denied him. It was really cool. The last time that we were there, we were at that place and, and uh, the guy that, that was uh, there with us, the other pastor, Daniel, was teaching this and, uh, and he said, and this is where Jesus, uh, when he had said to Peter that the rooster will crow three times, you're going to deny me before the rooster crows. And what happens right then? In the valley right below us, man, you can hear a rooster crowing just as plain as, as day. It was just like right on cue. It was the coolest thing ever. And everything echoes there because it's just all so close. So interesting. Well, then, so Jesus answers him and he says, So will you lay down your life for my sake, Peter? Most assuredly, I say to you, that the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Well, <laughs> I believe that that is really why, and it's one of the other places that we actually go and visit, when, um, when Jesus has his dialogue uh, with Peter after his resurrection at a place we call Tabga. And, uh, and that's where he says, do you love me more than these? And so that, that whole, then, if you love me, feed my sheep kind of a thing. And uh, the question that he asks Peter, do you love me like I love you? And how could Peter actually respond, oh yeah, I'm, I'm totally dialed in with you. I mean, he's just denied him just days before. So yeah, it would have a real effect on him. You can see, this is just so interesting when you get it. But here, back to John, 60 years after the fact, he's still remembering from the beginning, this is what we have known. Love one another. It will be the way that they will be able to tell whether or not you are the disciples of the Lord by how you interact one with another. Back to 1 John. So when you read that, think about it, you guys. When you read that upper room kind of thing, chapter 13, the guy that's writing this epistle 60 years later was in that room, seated right next, immediately, directly next to Jesus. He's the one who heard this. Wow. So, yeah, it left an impression on him, you can tell, because he's repeating it verbatim. It's what we have known from the beginning. Now, in verse um, 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another, and not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. Isn't this funny? We're doing this on Sunday, more, or on, on Sunday nights. We're going through Genesis, and we look through that. And so let's look at something that's kind of interesting. Why is this? Verse, 11, or verse 12 tells us he killed his brother, he murdered his brother. Why is that? Why did he murder him? Well, because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, that creates this debate that we've heard so many times. Well, why was it that Cain didn't, uh, didn't have his offering received and Abel had his? Why was that? And they have said, well, that's because, that's because Abel's was... Uh, a, a blood sacrifice, and, and Cain had uh, brought of the, the things of the ground, the farmer kind of things, and so um, that was the reason why. Well, wait a minute, those weren't specified. We're talking the second generation of human beings here. God hadn't said about what offerings were, that's all the law stuff. Now, we do know that they made offerings before the law, but these are only the second people. This appears much, much more to have a matter, does the matter of the heart. Now, if the Lord had specified and said, Cain, it's okay, you can bring one of the ground and Abel. If you want to bring one that's a blood sacrifice, both would be acceptable to me. The heart would still need to be right. The heart was totally wrong, and how do we know it? Because he killed his brother out of envy. So that's how you know. Well, here he says... Why did he murder him? Well, because his works were evil, his heart. He was an evil person, and his brother was righteous. Now, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Interesting. So the world and the evil that the world represents is capable even of murder. 
as we saw with Cain and Abel. So, at the same time, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Again, you know he was listening to what Jesus taught because I can show you about a half a dozen places where Jesus said the exact same thing. They will hate you because they hated me first. In fact, in one place, Jesus says, there's going to come a day when those people will put you to death and they're thinking that they're doing God a service. You imagine that? That was going on in their times. Now we have a different religion, even in our times, we call it Islam. And many in that believe that by putting people to death in the name of Allah, they are doing a service to him. Amazing. And it's, boy, when I was a kid, I didn't even know that there was a religion called Islam. Didn't even know. And I didn't know that there was the radicalized and there was the very much secular, just like we have within the church. You know, you have those people that are very much the fundamentalist, if you will, but then there's the other people that call themselves Christian but live like the heathen. Interesting. Well, such are the days. And plus, everything is like instant now. You can see whatever's going on anywhere in the world immediately. Well, in verse 14, it tells us this. So here's what we know. Once again, it uses this term over and over and over again. It's very important. We know that we have passed from death to life. Sounds like a pretty straightforward statement. I think every one of us here should be able to, to look at that and just know, have you passed from death to life? And if you might think that you're not really good at witnessing, my guess is you should be able to explain how that worked. You should know how to explain it. How did you pass from death to life? Well, I've been born again. Well, how'd that happen? Well, I acknowledged my sin before Jesus and knew that I couldn't save myself, so I acknowledged it and asked him for his forgiveness, that his blood would cleanse me of all of my sin. All right. Doing that and realizing that you were responsible for your own sin and you've repented of those things and you follow him, you acknowledge your sin, you walk in a place of fellowship with him, forgiveness when forgiveness is needed, you approach him at all times, there's a relationship that goes on with, between you and the Lord. You've passed from death to life. Now, he goes on to say this. <clears throat> because, how do you know that you are, we know this rather, that we have passed from death to life. Why? Because we love the brethren, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Going back to that loving of brothers. So, we can say, yeah, we can explain how the, the method of, of salvation took place. Now, is it also shown outwardly that that work has happened in you because of how you interact with your brothers and sisters in the Lord? So he says in verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, how many of you just on your way home from work had murder in your heart? I know I always use this about traffic, so you know I got a real problem with traffic. I know it. You know this about me. It's a weakness. I acknowledge it all the time. But, come on, just tell me you don't do this. Tell me you're okay with it. Oh, man, people cut me off. I'm just, praise the Lord, I love that person. I was like, you want to nuke them and you know it. Okay? It's true. Let's just be honest. Now, this is not what we're talking about. Those, those momentary, those fits, you get so frustrated and that kind of thing. That's not what we're talking about. There is the ongoing indifference and even outright what God would qualify as hatred that there's not love shown towards one another in an ongoing, purposeful, this is how I run my life kind of a way. So he's starting to get to the point of, yeah, we're really feeling totally convicted, but he's about to settle our hearts in this. So verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. Once again, you want the demonstration? You want to know what it looks like? You want to know the, whether or not you're his? Do you even understand that he's done that for you? And if he has, once again, you can explain it. By this we know love. We have seen it demonstrated. Why? By seeing him lay down his life for us. And so, because of that, what should follow? We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He's the example. Are we willing to sacrifice ourselves as he sacrificed himself for us? Heavy, heavy stuff. Well, it tells us in verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? There is no evidence of that truth. Now, there is so much that has been done in the name of the church based upon verses like this and not having a really good understanding because then it all becomes about all these outward things as though that somehow merits God's favor. 
So again, we have a lot of churches that that's all that it seems like they do. They focus everything about giving stuff to people and doing stuff in the world. I think that's wonderful. Let them do that. My question is, is there a message that goes along with the giving? That's a big question. Do you say, I am here in the place of God because he has moved upon my heart, because he loves you, therefore there's a context for why I hand you a sandwich or give you a blanket or whatever else. There's a reason why I do this. And I think it's even great if you're able to say, let me make sure that you understand something. There was a time when I wouldn't have given you the time of day like this. But because he loves me and has changed me, I cannot help but do what I am doing right now. Let me tell you about the love of Jesus while you eat the sandwich or while you warm yourself with the blanket or the coat or whatever else. Let me give you a context for why or else you will have filled them for a day, given them warmth for as long as they can keep the jacket without getting it stolen or whatever else, but you've done nothing about the eternal matters. You've done everything about the temporal. You get it? So... His love that is being referred to as John is talking about is the one that deals with the eternal stuff. And it is manifested by how you act towards them in an outward manner. It will demonstrate what's going on. Now, does this not sound reminiscent of, um, of what James taught? James chapter 2, let's go. We're going to start at verse 14. Now, let me address one thing really quick here. Because this has become such a contentious uh, matter within the church. Some, because there's this idea about we have to earn some level of our salvation by our actions and by our works. And they'll point to this verse that I'm about to point to, or they might point to the one like John. And they'll say, see right there it says works. Well, how do you reconcile that with what Paul says about it's not, a, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he has saved us. So what he says to Titus in Titus 3.5. Or if it is uh, what he says in Ephesians chapter 2 at verse 8, where he talks about that it's not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, it's the gift of God, salvation. It's by God's grace through faith. We get that. So that tells us that salvation is completely a work of Jesus Christ at the cross, and it is the acceptance of that belief. So how is it then that you reconcile what James has said here? Paul gives us the means of salvation. James gives us the outworking of salvation. What does it look like when you're saved in your actions? That's how you reconcile the two things. Paul is dealing with salvation. James is dealing with the fruit of it, and so is John. So when we read this in James at verse 14 of chapter 2, it tells us this. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now let's make sure we understand what he means by that. Let's take James is saying, let me take it by face value. Let me just take it that they say that they have faith, they say that they're a believer, I'm going to take them at their word. Can their simple declaration of their mouth save them when there's no evidence that they're even saved because there's no actions that, that show it? Because we know a lot of people that will claim to be Christians, but if you ask them, how do you know that you're saved? They can't even begin to tell you the, the most elementary aspects of the gospel. They'll tell you that they're a Christian because they grew up in a Christian household and because there was a picture of Jesus on the wall. Okay, I got a Bible from when I was a kid. Where is it? I don't know. It's in the garage, probably in a box. Okay, so if that's the extent of your Christianity, then the chances are the things about your life are going to show that kind of fruit. It's exactly what James is talking about here. So he says, can just a simple proclamation of faith, can that save them? Verse 15, if a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you do nothing to give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Now James is using more words than John is, but they're saying the exact same things. And of course, I have to ask you the question, where is it that they learned this from? From the Lord. And they watched him do such things. Remember, they were there when he fed the thousands. Hey, these people have a need. Well, he's going to use it as a miracle and everything else, but he was meeting a real physical need and wanting to see the disciples look at, at what it's like to be self-sacrificial in all things, being worried about other people. Remember, when they first got onto the boat, I'm sure that they had a conversation. But when they came towards the shore and saw the thousands, remember what it says about Jesus? He was moved with what? Compassion. Why? Because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. 
And so as he teaches them, then it becomes a real physical need that they had. Is he going to let it go? Of course not. He gives his disciples a demonstration. <clears throat> and he did it consistently. So James, John, basically 50 years apart in their writing, just in round figures, are saying the identical thing, and it's what they learned from the Lord. If anything we take from this, we should be really, really careful to say what we have learned from the Lord is something that we should be passing on along as well. These guys, James, John, those people that wrote what they wrote, the ones who saw him face to face, they were not some free agents just writing a biography. These were guys passing along what they had learned from the Lord himself when he was among them. So we're reading. And verse 17 says, Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. There's no life to your statement of faith when your life demonstrates something entirely different. It is not about earning your way to heaven like some people try to make it. Good grief. Like you could ever do something to perfect what Jesus did when he said it was finished. My goodness, what could we possibly do to fix that? Good man, oh man. So verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Well, he says, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you a faith by my works. So I'll give you a demonstration. I will tell you that I'm a believer and then I'll show you by the way that my life is lived. It's a good evidence. So you believe that there is a God and you do well. And so he goes on. So what you hear from John in just a verse is really elaborated on a lot by James, but it does not contradict what Paul taught. Salvation is a work of God by his sacrifice, and we are saved because of faith and his grace alone. That's it. However, the life should demonstrate that work. You'll see it in their actions. Back to John. And we see this in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, whether that's something that we write or something that we say, just somehow that we promote it. Let us do so in deed and in truth. And by saying in truth, the truth is it gives credence to what you have at times said or, or whatever else. It is your, your deeds are going to prove the validity or the truth of whether or not you're a believer. So let it be done in deed and in truth, not just in words. And then verse 19 transitions to kind of like the closing uh, part of this chapter. He kind of pivots a little bit and recaps a few things, and then he's about to go into chapter 4, picks up on the very tail end of chapter 3. Verse 19, this little pivot, it's like people are needing to be convinced, and so he is writing to them in a way of reassurance. Why would he do that? Well, again, let's step back from this for a second. And let's say that the people who are reading this might be kind of young in the Lord and haven't had a chance to get into a Bible, studying, a Bible study setting and had maybe the scriptures worked through as a group and like what we're doing right here. What if you just read it for the very first time and see, man, sin abiding and, and I did this and I'm unrighteous and there's no hope for me. And all. You might be freaked out by this point. Yeah? If there's no elaboration, you're just reading it at face value, even though he's given you the assurances, isn't it funny how every time that there's something that looks really scary in the scripture, we always focus on that and don't read all the stuff around it because we're thinking he's talking directly to us. Does that ever happen to you guys? Well, if you were one of those people in here and say, I don't care how much he tries to tell me otherwise, I'm toast. Well, verse 19, and, and by this we know, once again, that we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So this is that even though we understand that people may have doubts, he wants there to be assurance. And by this we know that we are of the truth. We are of the Lord. This is how we know. And it will assure our hearts before him. And he says this really cool thing, verse 20, because let's face it, the devil is really good about taking verses that are so filled with hopefulness and everything else, and the devil tells us, yeah, but that was written for everybody else, just not you. You ever heard the devil tell you that one in your ear? Oh, man, I see people walk in this all the time. They're so filled with love and joy in me. I walk around and there's always a cloud over my head and it's always raining, right? Happens, yeah? Well, verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, condemns, condemns, 
important for us to recognize the difference. Condemnation. If we want to try to understand what this is, how many times have we seen natural disasters damage a house and they put the X on it and they're just waiting for somebody to come and bulldoze it because it's condemned. It means that it's damaged beyond repair and there's no way to salvage it. That's what you do to a condemned building. You make it where it's, it's uninhabitable. There's nothing that can be done to repair it. You just bulldoze it. That's condemnation. That's being condemned. And how often does a Christian walk around like that? I feel so condemned. There's no help, hope for me. They just put a red X on my door and I'm just waiting for the bulldozers to come and plow me under. Get feeling like that, right? So, if our heart condemns us, what does it say? God is greater than our heart. Praise the Lord. God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Let us look at another place just so that we realize that we're not grabbing onto something and say, oh, it says what I want it to say, therefore it must be true. It is said elsewhere. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And it elaborates a little bit more on this. Now we'll see how fancy your Bibles are. Chapter 8 of Romans begins this way. It says, There is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Does yours have a comma? And then it says, who walk according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. Some of you might have it in italics. Others of you may have a little asterisk next to it and then it gives you the little notation down at the bottom of the page. But what it tells you is that in, in uh, older transcripts or older manuscripts, that last uh, phrase is not there. So it would read just like this. There is now therefore no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, period, not comma. Because if you have the comma and read the rest of it, then it seems like it's a qualifier, right? But I'm not walking according to the, to the Spirit. I'm walking according to the flesh. Therefore, I am condemned. And we start doing our whole Eeyore thing, right? So now here we, we put our nice little gray cloud above our head and we rain on ourselves because it's all over for me. Well, notice what it says in verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. What you have is a scribal insertion from verse 4 put into verse 1. It's not there in the original manuscripts. And it should read exactly this way. There is now therefore no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, period. Verse 4 will tell us, and if we're walking with the Lord, we will do those other things, just like Paul says, just like James says, like John says. But let's settle this matter. If you are in Christ Jesus and you are born again and saved, you are not condemned. If you fall into sin, you are being convicted and the Spirit is saying, get it right with the Lord. The devil's telling you, you can't get it right with the Lord. He's the one who's hanging the condemnation on you, but it's not the Lord. There's always, if there is breath, there is hope, friends. All right? Back to John. So, when he says... If our heart condemns us, there is one that is greater. God is greater than our hearts, and he knows all things. So, beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, then we have confidence towards him. Amen to that. Amen to that. See, I will every single day at some point, and it's going to happen multiple times, I will do something during the course of the day that if I was having God standing right next to me, he would say, it's not, it's not up to my standard. It's not perfect. Therefore, it's sin. I will do that at some point, multiple times, every single day. But do I ever walk away condemned? Absolutely not. Jesus died for every sin that I would ever commit. So I walk in the place of wanting to make sure that I'm approved of God, but never condemned. So I know that I can come to him like verse 21 says, if our heart condemns us, uh, we have confidence towards God. If our heart, rather, does not condemn us, we have confidence. So yeah, I have confidence. I can come to the Lord. I'm convicted. He draws me back to himself. I acknowledge those things. Everything is good between he and I. Verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his commandments, those things that he taught to us, and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, I have heard more prosperity preachers say that they look at these kind of passages. Of course, they never read the rest of it. They will read what Jesus says where he says, if you ask anything in my name, the Father's going to give it to you. And then they start asking for boats and houses and cars and money and you know, affluent things and all the rest of it. Well, look at what he says here. Because we keep his commandments, 
We know that we have what God asks because we're obedient to the things that he has taught us and because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. How does that have anything to do with material matters? People want to make it about material matters, and let's face it, they make, they make millions off of doing it. But that is not what the scripture teaches. Actually, in fact, when the scripture talks about material things, oftentimes it is shown as a huge stumbling block. And even as, uh, as Paul would have said to Timothy, those people that think that somehow godliness is gain, those are the kind of people that are just after for the money and you need to avoid those people. So interesting, huh? Verse 23, and this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Here's what he has asked of us to do. Believe him, the promises that he has made to us, the things that he has instructed us to do, this is what he desires, that we would walk in obedience. Now, it seems as though he gives a second one, but really what it is, it is the fruit of our obedience to him. So verse 23 says, this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing to the point of salvation. So that means everything that that implies. That means that I believe in who he is, what he did, what his position is, who I am in him and what that means, all of that is taken into account. And if that is straight, then we are going to love one another as he commanded us to do. That's just the evidence. But he wants us to be in him, right? Verse 24, now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. That means the, the Lord abides in us. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. That's a great place for us to end. And so here's one of the things that we should be doing at all times. We do believe that, as the scripture just says there, if you want to know whether or not a person is saved, are they, do they have the Holy Spirit? Have they, been, have they been saved and are they indwelt by the Spirit? Well, that's pretty easy to figure out. Have you acknowledged your need for him and for forgiveness? Absolutely. But there is this other thing that the Spirit does when he becomes resident in the heart. There are also those times where he is to empower the believers. And so that doesn't mean the crazy circus stuff like you see on television all the time. Because most of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not really big flamboyant over the top things that look great on a camera. Most of those things are quiet. Most of those things are done for the benefit of the body, but they're not done and seen outwardly. So what I would love for us to be able to do is we have people down here to pray with you tonight. And as you're praying for one another, we ask you to stay after and pray for one another. We should be praying that we would be filled with God's Holy Spirit as far as the dynamic things that, that manifest themselves into this world. They're not all the miraculous ones because look at what the gifts are. Again, some of them are just so behind the scenes, but they're so vital. We should also be making sure that as we consider what the scripture says, do we look at ourselves and say, am I born of the spirit? Am I born again? Does the spirit reside in my life? And if so, how do I know that? Ask these questions. And if you find that you're kind of faltering in them or you don't have the answers and you feel conflicted about that, stay after and pray with the people that you know or come down here and pray with one of us if you don't know the people around you and you're a little bit afraid of just making that open to a few people. There will be people down here to pray with you about this. But we need to not only be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit as far as him residing in us, like what verse 24 said, but we want to say, God, since you've done that, how may I demonstrate to the world by the empowering of your Holy Spirit that I am yours? Equip me and empower me to go into this world. And again, it's not supposed to be some weird thing. You're not supposed to have some light shine down from heaven and angels sing and you do all kinds of crazy things. That's not the way that the Spirit works. He doesn't draw attention to the person. He always draws the attention to the Lord. Amen? Let's stand and let's have a closing word of prayer together. Please don't be in a hurry to go out of here. Spend a little bit of time and pray with the people around you. Or if you need to, come down here and pray with one of us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your, your work of, of salvation in our lives. We thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit. As we've read here tonight, you've given that. That is the promise that we have your Spirit leading us in all truth. And even as we study your word, if it resonates in our heart, it resonates only because the Spirit has opened our understanding to it. 
Aside from that, it couldn't work. So, Father, we pray that you would be glorified in us. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the uh, power that it has to, to mold us and shape us. We thank you. We give you praise for this evening and ask that you'd be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember when I was first saved and